My name is Jennifer Gray Thompson, and I am the CEO of After the Fire. Welcome to the podcast, How to Disaster, Recover, Rebuild, and Reimagine. In this podcast, we bring you the very best practices, best hearts, and great ideas from other disaster-affected communities. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to the podcast, How to Disaster, Recover, Rebuild, and Reimagine. My name is Jennifer Gray Thompson, and I'm the CEO of After the Fire. We have a very special guest on this week's episode. Mr. Tennis Wick is the director of PRMD for the County of Sonoma. We're bringing Tennis on the show because he has a lot of experience navigating disasters while they're happening and also um, navigating, you know, how do you rebuild? What, What, from the public side, what is it that you need to know about? And how do you even navigate that as a public sector official, as well as the person on the other side of the rebuilding? I wanted Tennis to come on today because I saw his work during the 2017 wildfire disaster that struck the North Bay of San Francisco. It was an incredibly hard thing to navigate. And I feel like he really showed up for people. And it was not, um, at not, it was not without a great personal sacrifice in many ways. We often look towards the public sector in times of great disaster for all of the answers. We also often place all of the blame at their feet. And it's not that that isn't always warranted, but one thing we forget is that there's a human being at the center of that too. And they've often undergone the disaster themselves. One of the things that we do at After the Fire is we help public officials actually navigate this time. And we also help the public navigate public officials. This is really important work because there is no way to actually get through a disaster without collaboration from all sectors, public, private, and nonprofit. That requires a measure of grace at the time when it's most difficult sometimes to offer it. So I wanted Tennis to come on to talk about his experience navigating four mega fires and one flood in the past four years alone. So once again, welcome to the podcast, How to Disaster, and welcome to the show, Tennis Wick. Once again, welcome to the podcast, How to Disaster. Today's guest is Tennis Wick. And what I'd like to start off is having Tennis tell you about himself, his position, and what exactly do you do for the county? Well, good morning, Jennifer. Thanks for having me on. Um, Tennis Wick, uh, Director of Permit Sonoma. We're the land use regulation agency for the county. Uh, We balance environmental protection with sustainable development. And we also uh, staff the planning and intelligence section and emergency operations for the county. So I've had the pleasure of working with you for about four and a half years at the county. And during that time in 2017, we underwent a mega fire disaster covering four counties, heavily impacting Sonoma County. We lost about 6,000 units of housing. And it really was a um, sort of a, a a a sign of things to come for the rest of the American West. I'm hoping that you can talk to people today um, about your first year experience just as a human being in a lead position for the County of Sonoma and how you experienced that event. Sure. So about 10 days before the 2017 complex fire, we actually had done a, a tabletop exercise with our team in emergency operations uh, gaming a fire that happened above Oakmont. Uh, so we had the, the uh, strategy in place about how to respond to a fire. What we weren't prepared for is what happened that night. Uh, and for me, uh, I live in Petaluma um, and my phone started ringing around midnight. Um, to get up to the emergency operations center in in Santa Rosa right away. So flipped into my my clothes, got into my truck, started driving out of town, and I didn't get as far as Bodega Avenue, uh, just on the edge of downtown. Uh, before but for I'll people start. in another area, can you give them like the, the measurement of that? Because they may not know what Bodega is. So like Bodega is actually in Petaluma. Yes. And uh, sorry, Bodega is, as the name would imply, is the market road that leads from the coast and the agricultural part of the West County uh, into Petaluma and uh, the uh, connecting us with the uh, Bay Area. 
So major arterial, and at midnight, there's usually very few people on it. Uh, and when I got out there, there were thousands of cars streaming from the West County through town. Of course, we could smell smoke. Um, and as I passed the gas station on the edge of town, uh, there are people already fighting over gasoline. And I thought, okay, this is way bigger than anything we've dealt with. Um, and then, of course, going up the highway uh, with almost nobody going northbound and all the southbound lanes full, all the roads leading out of the county uh, jammed. Um, we were already in uh, chaos. Really, that's what it was. Uh, and when I got into the emergency operations bunker, uh, the setting was pretty similar. I think this was uh, the biggest disaster that the county had ever faced at that time. And um, I've, I've come to learn since going through many disasters since then here in Sonoma County and in other jurisdictions where we provided support, that that's the nature of it. There's a lot of disinformation flying back and forth. Uh, and our job is to sort that out, figure out what's really happening, where it's happening, and how we get resources there. So you, you know, this was the first time that we had experienced, um, anybody had experienced a mega fire of this magnitude and had taken out um, not just uh, homes in the wildland urban interface, but had actually taken the freeway overpass right. around and took out another 1500 homes. So you walk into the um, emergency operations center and um, there is, you know, one of the things I talk to a lot of leaders on this podcast, and one of the things that I always like to bring in is there is the call to duty and the call to action and to help. And at the same time, managing your own trauma, because it was an incredibly traumatic thing to witness. So can you talk about um, what mode you went into? Um, what were the next 10 to 14 days like for you? Nonstop. So we, we typically, uh, are told that we're going to operate on 12-hour shifts, uh, and it ended up being pretty much around the clock the first three days. Um, and as you said, you know, with parts of the fire attacking um, parts of Santa Rosa, like Coffee Park, that no one would ever think of as the wildland urban interface, and also uh, Oakmont, and then coming down Fountain Grove towards downtown Santa Rosa. Um, and that, that threat remained for over a week. Uh, so we were even looking at where to set up a local assistance center in Santa Rosa. And at the same time, we were also realizing the struggle that if we put it in certain locations, we, we'd still have the risk of the fire taking out the, the assistance center. So we were still fighting the fire and trying to help fire survivors simultaneously. Yeah, it was extraordinary. And you had the extra added bonus that we had many fires at once. So the Tubbs fire was the major fire, but Napa was also on fire, which borders Sonoma County. And where I right. live in Sonoma Valley, uh, we were surrounded by a ring of fire, which really hampered the county's ability to actually serve a valley of 40,000 people. And that was an extraordinary thing to, um, to witness both our strengths and our vulnerabilities. You also had uh, 400 people from patients from a very, very medically fragile community at Sonoma, uh, Sonoma Developmental Center. So can you address, you know, how the emergency operations uh, center had to be creative at times to make sure that the needs were met? Yeah, that was, and I'm glad you brought up the nuns fire and the uh, Etna fire in relation to Sonoma Valley, because that was an extraordinary time. Um, the, my family, like your family, has been in Sonoma Valley for generations, uh, very close to heart for me. And the incident commander, who's the CAL FIRE chief, who's in charge of the whole thing, um, called at one point and said uh, his team, which is an extraordinary group of people, um, were tapped out. And he wasn't sure how long he could hold the fire off from the town of Sonoma. And... Uh, he needed us to come up with an evacuation plan for Sonoma Valley. Um, and that we had four hours to do it uh, before he would have to execute. So uh, I've, I've told this to numerous groups since then 
that um, it really showed the power of a liberal arts education because the people on our team are, are uh, from all sorts of backgrounds, technical and liberal arts. And that emphasis on public service, critical thinking and clear communication, the, the pillars that we use for hiring in our civilian life here in Permit Sonoma served us really well that night. Because you can go through all the training in the world you want, uh, but when you receive a task like that, you need creative thought and people that can work well and communicate and operate quickly. So we had to do what people might see uh, more typically for hurricanes in Florida and figure out contra flow on state highways to get thousands, tens of thousands of people onto public transit and out of harm's way. Um, so, Part of it was identifying the most vulnerable populations, as you mentioned, uh, those at Sonoma Developmental Center, those at senior homes, uh, figure out how we are gonna wrangle every single bus in the region to come in. How do we get them in as cars are going out? Uh, and then where we take them. So all of the, the sensitive populations had to go to places outside of harm's way in the East Bay and the inner Delta. Uh, that was an incredible logistics exercise. And then for uh, fire survivors um, who needed an, another place to go, we at first were uh, relocating them to the uh, Civic Center in Marin County and then found out two hours into the four, we wouldn't be able to. Uh, so I called my old friend, Steve Page. And it's an, ex it's an example of the extraordinary nature of Sonoma County. So here's someone I've known for decades um, called him and said, Steve, I need uh, your help. And he said, what can we do? Uh, I said, I need a place to put 20,000 people. Uh, and he said, okay, we'll be ready. What else do you need? It was a 90 second conversation. There was no histrionics. It was just about what do we do to help the community? And that just galvanized things for our team and up until 10 minutes of the execution point, we had a plan in place. It was being implemented. Uh, transportation was coming in. Logistics were already setting up at the raceway. And that's when the incident commander and called and said, we think we can hold the fire. Wow. Uh, that's interesting because you and I have had a lot of conversations about this fire and a lot of experience together. Um, and I knew that you had called Steve Page, and for our listeners who don't know who Steve Page is, um, he just retired as the longtime manager of Sonoma Raceway, which is a very large, prominent raceway in town. He's one of the most steady, uh, oh. competent, kind, and um, admirable leaders that I've ever worked with. And I, and both, um, I know that I benefited from your phone call because I was evacuated, my sister um, my entire family, um, my mother, my niece, my husband, yeah. and that we went to go to the Sonoma Raceway. And that's where we evacuated to. I slept in my car with my dogs because I still had to work. And um, I, you know, and immediately when we pulled up, I remember fi finally rounding that corner and it was, it was at night because it took a long time and all the lights were blaring and yeah. there were people waiting for us with whatever we needed and then coming around and checking on us. So it really was um, uh, one of the most uh, moving experiences, especially as somebody who's a helper and I don't accept a lot of help, which is something we will talk about in this podcast, um, to feel uh, safe and to feel sort of rescued in that moment. So I applaud that decision. Um, and it's also the value of relationships. Like you oh. knew, you knew exactly who you were dealing with ahead of time. And there's just so much to be said about leaning on those relationships in a time of great crisis. That we fortunately haven't let go of to this day, uh, aside from my office phone annoyingly going off with a spam call just now, almost all, uh, and I, I know this among all my peers in professional life that people I deal with, we're on cell phones now. We don't use our office phones anymore. Yeah. So it is. It has quickened the relationships and deepened the relationships that we have with people after the, the disaster. So it's a good thing. Uh, it's very important because then at some point you realize, especially working 20 hours a day, I would feel guilty for the four hours I was sleeping, but 
you know, you do get sort of to the other side and then, and you, and the fire becomes contained and it took, it actually burned in our area for 24 days. Yeah. Um, but it was contained pretty well after about 10 to 12 days. The, the, the danger was, um, you know, lessened. And then for you, in addition to doing that, um, you then had to make decisions with the county leadership about how is it, do we even begin to approach rebuilding 6,000 units of housing? And we're going to do this with people who are um, traumatized and have had a lot of things done to them that were not their choice. And all of a sudden you have six, you know, at least 5,000 people who have never wanted to build a house ever have to become independent contractors. So let's yeah, talk so, about what that was like. Yeah, it was a, it was a big, so it was an adrenaline drop where you're just constantly going. I think I lost, <laughs> thankfully lost 10 pounds over the course of about two weeks. Um, just being, uh, on adrenaline the entire time. So we had to transition out of disaster response and into recovery. So what it meant for our organization is inspectors moved out into the field with CAL FIRE uh, peers, started doing the uh, important uh, code determinations on each of the properties. So red tag, uh, yellow tag, green tag, along with a damage assessment that's done. Um, for emergency management purposes on thousands of properties. Uh, so that was going on in one arm of our organization. The other arm of our organization was working with some, uh, some colleagues in the county on a joint local assistance center with the city. So taking over the old newspaper building in the downtown of Santa Rosa while the fire's still going. And, uh, setting up a system where people could come in and start rebuilding their lives. Uh, and that wasn't just the bureaucracy of getting uh, your house re-permitted. It was really helping people recreate their identities. And what I mean by that is most people in these fires, they lost all their credentials. So they lost birth certificates, passports, driver's licenses, all the things that those of us who haven't been through disaster just take for granted and all of the benefits that accrue from those documents. They lost all that. So we had people in the local assistance center from the Department of Motor Vehicles, from uh, Social Security Administration, from the State Department, um, for both the United States and Mexico, uh, so that people could get that part done. They could then move into working with insurance advocates, with uh, people from the construction industry, uh, from uh, the licensing contractors board, things they could learn about what to look for when they're hiring and not hiring a builder. So in addition to getting records on their property, so it took sometimes three hours to work through all that, but they came out the door really thankful because they, they had their, they walked out with a provisional driver's license, uh, passport, um, some way of uh, figuring out how to get their, their birth certificates, which of course come from uh, many states or different countries um, and getting starting to get their life back together. Um, and then we had to reopen our doors here at uh, Permit Sonoma, where we normally serve about 150 people a day in our permit center. Uh, that first day we opened, it was, I believe 425. Uh, so an extraordinary number of, of people coming through who were uh, with raw nerves, some with anger, some in tears, some both. Uh, but the, uh, the, the moment I will always remember was this couple who uh, would be about my parents' age. So they were, they were in their approaching 90s. They'd lost their house. Um, and here was this very proud man who was just exhausted. His, his wife was asking the right questions and getting records for their property. And you could just see he was about to, to break down and lose it. And our very um, wonderfully crusty uh, engineer, uh, surveyor, county surveyor, uh, Gabe Gabrielson saw this and just quietly went out, kind of uh, took him to the back of the office where he could um, have his cry, compose himself and come back and join his spouse. And I thought, 
that that's the moment things started building back for us. Yeah. It's amazing. Um, and I think Gabe is a great surveyor, by the way. Uh, it's amazing though, how being human uh, to each other, like in our best, yeah. like that's the thing I actually love about disaster is while it is a terrible thing that happened and I don't love that it happened at all, but I do um, appreciate the opportunities for the very best of humankind to show up. And, oh my we're God. All, yes. you know, we're going to make mistakes. Um, we're going to sometimes, um, you know, grouch even at each other or make decisions or, you no. know, from a place of trauma. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. You know me. Yeah. Yeah. Tennis and I are friends. So he, <laughs> yeah, he knows. It's fine. I am exactly. I still fear you to this day, even when we're on camera. Oh, you don't fear me at all. I tried to work. So he, so funny. Here's my interjection. As I'm driving back uh, to the county after two weeks of serving in the Valley, I am driving back to my um, cubicle in my with the uh, window view, smallest cubicle in the county. And uh, I look up in the hills of Glen Ellen and I say, you know, what I want is to have, dedicate my life to rebuilding this place, to helping these people. Like was, I want to put all my, whatever I can do. And I don't know how, what I can do really. So the first person I tried to go work for was you. I wanted to be your ombudsman because I actually, I really right. respect you and I like working with you. And so that is a, a compliment, except you didn't hire me. So, but I'm okay <laughs> with that. Cause I think I've landed on my feet. It's all good. You're not a code nerd and you never will be. <laughs> and thank, thank you for that. <laughs> this well, is much better for you. Well, it, it is. It's actually a great fit for me, but it also still allows uh, me to work with people like you and you specifically. And so, um, you know, I, I do choose the people I admire to be on this podcast, and um, I and this is why this is why we're here. But it was a it was such an extraordinary thing to work for the public sector because so much anger, trauma, and grief it was in the community. It really. For someone who's never experienced a wildfire disaster, it is very much a run for your life situation that gets progressively often way worse than you think it, it could possibly be. This is like, it gets, it's really bad and somehow it's worse because the fire monster is still coming for you. And yeah. people lose, and as you said, unlike wind and rain, like sometimes they lose everything but often they don't or they can find their identity. And so it was like the clothes, like, people do evacuate in their skivvies, you know, or naked. Like this is, it's a, it, for their lives. They run for yes. their lives. And so you are now having to serve a population um, who need to rebuild their lives and to do it in a way that reduces the trauma. And one of the things that I really like um, about how we approach this in Sonoma County has to do with the block captain system. Oh, um, good. I'm glad you brought it up. I'd love it if you could talk about how uh, that actually served both the public and the public sector servants, because we try to talk, we try to talk communities into, like, we highly recommend it, put it that way. And it's often met from the public sector side with a lot of concern that now it's going to organize and weaponize against them. And I always try to help yes. them understand that it's actually, it's just, it's all of us doing our part. So can you talk about the impact? Sure. I think it, 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 uh, the block captain's uh, idea, at least in my experience, really emanated with uh, Supervisor Gore. Um, and it, it was really great because he made sure that uh, the, the bureaucracy didn't do its control psychology thing, which it typically does. It says, we're going to have a meeting in this location at this time. We're going to give you this information. You're going to, you're going to uh, assimilate it and leave. That's the convention of how government works. Uh, and he turned it on its head and said, look, fire survivors look at Santa Rosa as a community or Sonoma as a community, not whether they're in the incorporated or unincorporated area. So we're going to uh, let these communities who already uh, figure out, who already know who they are, and they're going to come to us with their leaders, and we're going to be, we're going to go out into their community, which obviously had been decimated in the case of um, Larkfield Wiki up in, in Coffee Park. So we're going to, we're going to let them tell us where it's convenient for them to meet at what time and in what place. And we're gonna be there 
whether we're in the, the water utility, the county government or the city government. And we're gonna be there with um, people from the trades and uh, nonprofits, whoever these people need. And your, your job is to just be available. That was great. It set a tone that said from the leadership down that these people are our first priority. Listen to them. And from that, you'll figure out what you need to do. That was fabulous. And it not also, to be afraid. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Yeah. So then it, it got, and, and fortunately, people like David Guin, who was my counterpart at the city at the time, uh, were already friends outside work. Um, and it really helped reinforce with us what we were already informally talking about was, and that was taking a common approach to the rebuilding portion of it, in that we um, both both organizations were already looking at uh, record business before the disaster, uh, and having fire survivors have to wait in the same line with other people was just not realistic. Uh, we realized we had that the, the local assistance center was a, a common success. We needed to build on that, maybe in a little bit different way so we could provide the oversight we needed to. Uh, but we brought in um, consultant teams at each city, at each uh, government center and uh, committed to five day turnaround on permits. Um, and I, and maybe that would have happened without the block captain process, but, uh, it certainly, uh, after going to the first couple of meetings with block captains, there was no way we could do things the way we used to. We had to come up with something that was different. And um, yeah, it's worked. In fact, the trailers in which the rebuilding uh, happened here at the, uh, the Resiliency Permit Center, we still have it in the old Planning Commission chambers, but it used to be in trailers out here for years. Those trailers are finally uh, leaving today. Uh, oh, really? Wow. I remember when they went up. They were up within like two weeks post-disaster. Yeah. It's also, I think really what you're touching upon is the dedication to that sort of creative problem solving that you mentioned at the very yeah. beginning there too. And also a commitment to meet people where they're at. Like that's a hard, that is a just critical in disaster. Uh, you know, our first question we always ask, and it sits at the center of our organization, is we say, what do you need and how can we help? which is yep. very different from, uh, we know you have needs, here's what we're willing to do. Just a different. Absolutely. It's a different yeah, And it started to impact our practice uh, after disaster in our, in our regular work. And accidentally, you, I know you didn't mean it this way, but it ended up being great. And it, it's very much um, part of our work anyway, is that, you know, the, the consultant team that you brought in, and we don't need to name them necessarily because we don't, we can't endorse, um, but they have since been in so many other areas. Like we work in Santa Cruz and now they're there and we work in Jackson County, Southern Oregon, and they are, uh, I believe they're coming on there as well. Yeah, and so they're also been, in the city of Paradise. Yep, uh, they sure are. Yeah. They've done a great job with Paradise. Um, and it's, it's been, uh, you know, you accidentally sort of gave them this specialty and it reduces the trauma significantly yeah. for the people who are having to undergo. Um, it's not just the trauma of running for your life and then it's the trauma of losing your house. And then it's the trauma of, or the process and the journey of actually rebuilding your house. And for some people, despite best efforts, they were still um, the victims of contractor fraud. Can you address that? The contractor fraud part or the whole? Uh, Either or, or all of the above. But contractor fraud is just always a, a major concern. And no, I don't think any disaster community ever escapes it, you know? It, no, no, I don't think so either. I mean, you can read books by Carl Hyacin that actually find a way of making it humorous. Um, but it is something that unfortunately happens in every disaster, uh, you know, looting and fraud. Um, it's just part of human nature, unfortunately. Um, in fact, we were just talking about the, the stress that the entire state uh, is under with all multiple disasters, not having enough pro professionally licensed contractors uh, to do the work uh, that needs to be done, the strain on uh, labor and materials. Um, so 
what our what our contractors, both in Permit Sonoma and and then the rebuild division, are facing in the Resiliency Permit Center, uh, is that they they inspect homes for code compliance, but not all quality assurance that uh, the homeowner is contracted for. So. Um, if your building is stout and meets code requirements, it passes inspection. Uh, but there might be really horrible installation of cabinets and, and countertops. Uh, and if you're the homeowner, all that's important to you because you're pulling every financial string possible to make it all work. Um, and people are under constant strain if they don't have a good, reputable contractor. Uh, and uh, you know, that stress probably starts way back in insurance. If you're underinsured, um, you're already coming in with less money than you need to, to build back what you had. Uh, so unless you're going to build a smaller place, um, you're constantly going to be under pressure. So that's one of the things we really guard against. And fortunately, we have a district attorney that works, has uh, people in her office assigned to work with us. On uh, at a local level on contractor fraud and also uh, with local investigators from the uh, licensing board that are based here in Santa Rosa. And I think um, and I, I think that for some people who have never experienced a disaster, um, one of the common things that happens is everyone wants to get back to normal right away. And even though that day is gone, like that you can't get yeah. after the 7th back, it's not happening, uh, which is very, you know, also deserves its own level of grief. But part of that means that people who are in this survivor position, they make a lot of decisions trying to get everything right back to where it needed to be. It's a trauma response. And, sure. it, you know, when it, we, we do a lot of work with Fannie Mae. And um, if, they, if, they, if they or Freddie Mac um, underwrite your mortgage, you can actually um, push your, you know, if you have a 30 year fix, you're in year seven, you can actually push year seven to year 31 and, and take a minute. And I think that the more people understand that there are mechanisms to help you, um, you know, you need a minute. Um, a lot has changed since 2017, though, in the world yeah. of rebuilding. Uh, you know, rebuilding takes many, many years and Sonoma County is really far, far ahead of the curve for, uh, you know, ahead of predictions by far. Um, and there's many reasons for this. And the first reason is our land values are very high yeah. and um, there is an, we are incentivized. Go ahead. And because of that, uh, people are in uh, usually indebted and that debt uh, came along with an insurance requirement that that valuation and insurance didn't necessarily carry through to our more rural counties where it's really been hard to rebuild. Uh, rural counties, actually, as we transition into our, um, our, our evolution and our rebranding, which is after the fire, um, our major concern is uh, rural counties. And they're a very, um, it's very, very difficult to recover or rebuild if you're not a well-resourced county. You can be rural, we are rural and well-resourced, but most rural counties are not well resourced. And so we can talk about that a lot. Um, but I would like you to talk about the last, uh, in the last four years, you've navigated four mega fires and one flood. So right. talk to us, like between 2017 and today, you know, what have you learned or what has surprised you the most? What mis I mean, you've learned a lot. So, but what would you want somebody who's listening to this podcast to know who is a public sector leader? And then what would you want a fire survivor to know on how to navigate this? Ooh, well, that's quite a question. I know. Uh, what I, I'll tell you, uh, well, maybe I could relate it to something that's happened most recently because you're right. I feel like we have been on average in emergency operations 60% of the year since 2017, either responding to flood, fire, power shutdown, pandemic. We've been involved in all of them. Um, it has created a level of uh, readiness that uh, makes me incredibly proud of being part of the county family. Um, it's exhausting to, to especially do that and then fall back into your, your, your regular civilian life and then uh, at a moment's notice back into disaster. 
Uh, but what that constant back and forth has taught me is we can't live this way anymore. And that we have to stop responding to disaster and get in front of it once and for all. So yesterday we, uh, there's a, a press release informing the public that we've released our draft hazard mitigation plan. That use, This is a plan that people to, used to take um, as an obligation, um, not the first priority. Uh, and this is basically how we respond to different types of hazards. Uh, and it's necessary for to have in place and have it certified in order to get federal funding. Well, now we understand existentially why it's important and that disaster doesn't care about bureaucratic borders. So we did it in concert with a number of other local governments, cities, fire districts, all together. So uh, I think it prepares us better as an overall community for disaster. Uh, and uh, we'll have us ready for the kind of funding we need to respond. But it's still a response document. Mm -hmm. However, it will help us as we overhaul the general plan to start addressing some of the climate action uh, needs um, that are obviously here. Um, because sea level rise is accelerated, fires have accelerated, flooding has accelerated, drought has accelerated, uh, and you can either be overwhelmed by it or you can start planning for it and, and being smart about it. So one of the things that happened in this last fire, um, it was, uh, as I have related to people, um, we have a really great relationship with Ben Nichols, who's the Cal Fire Chief. Born and raised here, the man knows every contour in this county. And he came in for uh, a midnight burrito dinner in, uh, in the bunker. And uh, it was a rare moment because many of the staff from our natural resource and fire and planning staff are also in emergency operations. So we took an opportunity to talk to our fire specialist about how we get in front of this. Uh, how do we stop responding to fire and learn to manage it and live with it? And you start by interviewing your fire specialist, your fire expert. And he said, fire is always looking for its next meal. And uh, there, with the, with the uh, war map that we have up, he, over uh, with the whole county shown, he took us through. So what are the three areas we need to be focusing on? And he pointed to the lower Russian river. Because you know, the time the wall bridge fire was just coming through there, we're trying to. Uh, Mark West, which is just topographically, meteorologically ideal for fire over and over again, as we've learned. And then, as you mentioned, uh, fire has tried but failed so far to get, thankfully, to get through Glen Ellen and Kenwood and over Sonoma Mountain to Petaluma Valley. So with that charge, we started applying for um, the BRIC grant, the Building uh, Resilient Infrastructure and Communities application. Uh, we, especially our fire and natural resource people, took all of their experience from all these disasters and their, their uh, storied uh, professions and put that energy into this proposal. And what we told the Federal Emergency Management Agency and the Governor's Office for Emergency Services is, look, Sonoma County is a different kind of place. Uh, it's a very representative uh, county in some ways, um, but also has this unique experience to constant response to disasters in a relatively short period of time. And what we think with a population of half a million and a million acres, with so much of this uh, wildland that's at risk of fire in private hands, we can create a management with all different tools that starts with the building and works out and from the wildland and works in to focus on structural hardening, defensive space and vegetation management. And vegetation management with all measure of tribal partners and learning how to do prescribed burns, fire experts in prescribed burns, taking care of fire breaks that we've already built with all these fires, agricultural partners who can show us how to use livestock and crop planting as fire breaks, uh, mechanical uh, fuels management, hand fuels management, uh, 
all of these measures in these three geographic areas, and then we can scale it up for a whole county, and then we can become an example for, for how that can apply in the state and the federal government. So it was with great pleasure uh, and surprise during um, a fire division uh, staff meeting when this little email came up on the right hand corner of my computer screen during the Zoom that said, White House press conference, please click here. And I, at first I thought it was spam uh, and thought, what the heck? So I clicked on it and, and it was the White House and there was the president along with Governor Newsom, Vice President Harris uh, and Governor uh, Brown from Oregon announcing that Sonoma County would be the first recipient of a BRIC grant application in the country. So out of a $400 million program, uh, 37 million of that is dedicated to us. Um, so we've found the money to match the grant. Thank you, Board of Supervisors, for giving us the opportunity to um, innovate and and uh, spend the time on this application that we need. And now we're now's the the fun part. Um, uh, Mark Gillarducci from uh, the who heads at OES wanted a Scouts Honor promise that uh, we would live up to our end of the bargain. And here we go. And I think, uh, you know, it was a moment of pride um, for every person in Sonoma County to see, um, it, you know, all of the hard work that um, has been put into um, actually applying for that grant and, and, and the work, you know, sort of everything we've been through for the past almost nearly four years yep. and that we um, collectively lean into learning. And, and and how to do better, and then also how to pay it forward. So whatever we, I, I love that he, um, Pink, that, you know, I call him the douche secretly, don't tell him that, he'll never listen to this podcast, <laughs> all, so it's fine. Um, he's the head of Cal OES, and he, you know, basically said, you know, do this, do this right, and and do this well, and, and what we know is that you, you're going to do this right, you're going to do this well, you're going to make mistakes, but also you're going to pay it forward, to other communities yeah. so that they too can have, so they can sort of start a little bit ahead of, you know, where we, I feel like in Sonoma County, um, we have to, we are innovating our way through this, uh, which is great, but um, I'm always shocked by the lack of systems that were um, created. I feel like they should have been created like 40 years ago, but we didn't know. And now our big, now our big job is to uh, mitigate the risk and I am a ardent supporter of, of vegetation management and, yes. and, a, and an aggressive investment there because we have historically mismanaged our wildlands or neglected them. We've made it political as opposed to, right. you know, it is a public health issue. It's an infrastructure issue. So can you talk about like the sort of shift in the paradigm that is in the process of happening and is imperfect for sure. I personally would like to see about a hundred million in the hopper for uh, vegetation management on private lands. I recently got a question from a reporter though, who said, you know, why should our federal dollars go to help people with, on private land mitigate their risk? So I know how I answered, but I wanna hear how you're going to answer. Well, so that's, you know, it is, and it's a fair question to ask mm -hmm. um, because we've, well, one, as a community, we've allowed people to move into the wildland urban interface so collectively, we all own that, whether we think it was the right thing to do or not, that's the environmental setting we have. We're all at risk. Tell people and ask people in Coffee Park where the wildland urban interface is. You know, we're all in it now. I think with climate change coming at us in multiple ways, folks, we're all at risk. So, uh, unless we want to suffer the tragedy of the commons that we, you know, that most of us suffer because one person doesn't act, uh, we've got to respond collectively to this. Uh, if there are political and social equities and economic equities that have to be worked out in the meantime, so be it. But, uh, but now we're spending billions of dollars of tax money in disaster response that's certainly not the best way to be using our funding. I think we're gonna end up spending less money working on uh, smart disaster intelligence and, and the proper management of natural resources. 
Thanks. I'm so glad. It's, yeah. Uh, and, and it costs about six times the amount to actually respond to a disaster than it does to actually mitigate the risk of the disaster. So yeah. the public pays for it regardless. And um, and 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 I, I I'm hoping too that we can um, integrate the question and the very important mission of equity into wildland fuel um, you know mitigation because every time we have one of these mega fires, it exacerbates an inec our, our already existing inequity. They're almost at risk of actually for, uh, you know, health, um, uh, for their health being affected by the smoke alone sure. is definitely a question of equity. And so they don't, rec you know, if you are a marginalized community, your ability to recover at the same rate is just not, the, it's just, it's, it's completely unequal. So we and have there's to an element of the BRIC grant that will focus on that because it's something we didn't do our best of in 2017. Uh, and I think we all have had to acknowledge that yeah. and uh, things have improved. Are they optimal? Nope. We've got to do a lot better. We do. And, but I have, um, you know, I have confidence and I think that, it, I think one of the main things is we have to continue to call each other in and yeah. uh, really resist the opportunity to call each other out so often, you know, there's a lot of anxiety that's played out on social media, um, about, and a lot of armchair experts on wind and rain, oh, yeah. and fire and energy and COVID and health. And, you know, I, I think there's a lot to be said for, uh, you know, having a push back to the return of some respect for expertise. And, you know, like, I don't tell you how to build a building. I just, you know, I don't because you, you went to school for that. You, you know, you know, things, you know, I can say, I would like more, uh, you know, during a disaster, I would like us to invest in Alicia Sanchez at KBBF and to make sure that all these PSAs go out verbally on the radio in Spanish and indigenous languages. Um, that ICE, for example, will not be at our emergency shelters because you know, those, sort, those sorts of things. But I think that we are definitely getting there. So yes, what's your advice? So say that this is a person who's in uh, Montana and for some reason they've picked up this podcast and all they want to know is, uh, you know, which, what's, how do I navigate this? How do I navigate the trauma in my community? And at the same time, um, as a helper, how do I take care of myself? Well, I could say as a local government official, mm -hmm. if you're in that, and you're in that place where disaster hasn't hit you, but you kind of know it's coming, start training now. Uh, it was, and you know this from your time in in county service. It was treated in Sonoma County as an afterthought. It was this grudging obligation we had to fulfill. Um, and that culture has completely changed. We now use it as a uh, placement on a team and we're about 40 out of 150 people, uh, 40 who are active in emergency operations. And frankly, probably another 50 who are in field response. You have to perform well in your uh, civilian role in order to be considered. So it is almost uh, in some ways uh, uh, an excellence academy for public service. Uh, and fortunately, it also feeds back on itself by creating, a, um, I think, a better public servant that comes out of that back into civilian work. Um, but what I would say to my, uh, with that in mind, to my colleagues uh, who haven't been through this yet, you will. I don't know what form it's gonna take, but it's gonna to happen to you. So start training now. Reach out to your local FEMA reps. Uh, feel free to reach out to me. I talk with people all over North America, uh, uh, in Canada and the United States. I've been up to British Columbia and spoken there. Um, my, my, uh, my home province away from California. And um, it's all of us sharing. I've learned a whole lot. Uh, in British Columbia, especially from how they work with First Nations people who are way more involved in disaster response and planning. So you also bring back something um, and that experience you gain, you can it comes back to the community uh, manifold and you can give back your yourself through mutual aid. Um, but I would much rather be talking with people in this forum and directly off camera about it before their disaster hits. So um, yeah, I'd say start preparing now, it's coming your way.
And it's very hard because we're human and we engage in magical thinking that it won't happen right. to us. And we see it on the news. And I think until I saw our, you know, my hometown on CNN, I didn't even, I had no clue. We've been through earthquakes. We've been through other things, right. but there's something about being the object of the story uh, that was uh, made it almost made it more heartbreaking. And even, even though it was mo- you know, the intentions were fine, but it was um, a surreal experience in that sense, for sure. Hey, so tennis, how do you take care of yourself as a public leader, though? Because one of the things that um, we talk about is um, how to help the helpers. And so I would love, if you don't mind being a little bit personal for, you know, no, how no, do you no. do it? I, uh, so how do you take care of yourself? Yeah, how do you take care of yourself? So I, um, <laughs> It came home to me in a number of ways. Uh, I was actually up in the state capitol at a conference um, about four years ago. And of all the risks that I've had, I've had to say goodbye to my family twice during natural disasters because I wasn't sure if I was going to see them again. So uh, I make it through all of this stuff. I'm in a crosswalk uh, right near then Governor Brown's flat and I'm run over by a car. And um, so I had to recover from that uh, during disasters, something I still live with. And so now I just make my own personal health number one priority, physical and mental health. Uh, I get lots of sleep. Um, I, I don't drink anymore. Um, caffeine's my only, uh, my only sin. Um, and I make sure that I spend a lot more time with my family. Um, and really focus on those core parts of my uh, my personal life that are really important to me. So that's my own approach. Well, and I think there's, um, I think, you know, I would just, I want to make sure that people really, really hear you that you have to, as a helper, you have to prioritize your yeah. own physical and mental well-being. Uh, we've seen a lot of people um, that we, like our colleagues and friends um, who have, prioritize the community. So it's good to give a lot, but you're not supposed to give everything. And I think that's really what I'm hoping. Yeah. Got to make time for yourself. So uh, we're going to close out here. And I guess I, what I would like to know is, um, do you have anything to add that I haven't asked or anything you'd like the public to know? Um, And including like, it's, that's very nice of you to say that they can reach out to you directly. And to be clear, it is a permit Sonoma um, tennis wick. You can find him online, or you can look at the first um, slide in this podcast and it will give you contact information. So please do please reach out. And I would say to people, you know, what, what I see happening, uh, and it's not just in the public sector, but I see it throughout the community, turn off media for a while and just experience what's happening because I think actually there's a lot more good news out there than bad that there that we are finding a way to respond much you turn on six o'clock news and you think the entire state is burning and uh, damnation is tomorrow it's not we're actually finding ways to get in front of the problem and start solving it and as long as we all stay focused it's easy to find in this environment the worst case I am focusing on people who, are, who will work with me to find the best case and make it better. And I, I see it out there every day and that's what gives me hope. And I have every expectation that we're going to uh, successfully deal with climate change and, and disaster. And I, and I am positive that the only way we're going to do it is together. Yep. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Tennis Wick, Director of Permit Sonoma at the County of Sonoma. I appreciate your time and your uh, friendship and all of your work and service to the community. Likewise, my friend. I look forward to seeing each other in person. Yeah, it's good. Take care. Thank you for joining us on the podcast, How to Disaster. For more information, please visit our website at afterthefireusa.org. And if you liked this video, please hit subscribe.